Matt, what's the stats on old Bobby M? All right. So Exodus comes in at number 75 in, 19, in the 1970s on best ever albums. One ahead of the cars. So hmm. back to back here. Uh, number 11 in 1977, number 292 of all time. It did make Rolling Stones list coming in at number 71 of all time. Okay. And now it I'm is, gonna... and I'm sorry, and it is Bob Marley and the Whalers' highest rated album on Best Ever Albums. Yes. As well. Now, I would make the argument that Bob Marley is probably one of the most iconic figures in music that we will talk about. Um, I, I can't think of somebody that has ha, had a more cultural influence or at least kind of, you know, posters on the wall of people, people trying to imitate Bob Marley than, than uh, any other artists that we've talked about. So I'll that's... argue that if you talk about an artist in the context of their country, Bob Marley to Jamaica yes. is probably yes, he as is big as it gets, right? Like yes. I, I can't think of any person who's as big comparative to their specific country as Bob. Can you guys think of anybody who fits that? I mean, the Beatles probably, but that's like... I don't know though because there's, there's so many so other many British, British artists. Yeah, that yeah were I mean, huge. Like... Yeah, well, I get, you need the size of the country to matter too. Then I suppose maybe I don't know. That's a good question. Um, we'll come back to that, Josh. Yeah, maybe mm-hmm. Rush in Canada. But we'll see. <laughs> BTS. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe something like that. Um, so Bob Marley was born February 6, nineteen forty-five, in the Nine Mile district or parish of uh, St. Anne Parish in Jamaica. And Nine Mile is very much a rural uh, part of Jamaica. His father was a white man named Norval Marley, who is British, and his mother was Sadella Malcolm, who Afro-Jamaican uh, woman. He never met his father and died, and uh, his father died in 1955 when Bob was 10 years old. Um, now, I, I did watch the Marley doc, which is um, from a few years back, and it seems based on you know testimony from his wife and from other people interviewed in the doc the the fact that he was uh, a mixed race uh, was something that he w- affected him in his life and he was bullied for in Jamaica when he was a child and kind of impacted him in a way so um, I thought that was interesting um, his mother uh, went on to remarry um, later on. Um, down the road and while a child while as a child in nine mile he met neville livingston who is also known as bunny whaler and is one of the original whalers and they became fast friends and actually uh related because later on marley's mom had a child with bunny whaler's father so they were kind of half brothers as well um he bob marley moved to kingston when he was 12 um in the area famously known as trench town which is a or famous... funky kingston <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> um marley's uh um friendship with uh bunny whaler they d- this is w- while in trench town is where they formed a vocal group um, and decided to pursue music more and they were influenced by the ska and american r&b that was uh projected or you know, released, caught up in the airways in Jamaica at the time. Um, at this time, while in Trenchtown, Marley also met Joe Higgs, who was a pro- professional musician um, in a duo, and uh, he really influenced Bob Marley and um, taught him how to play guitar as well. So he was getting this kind of musical background from from all over the place. In 1962, Marley recorded some solo songs. But um, as a solo artist, but they didn't sell well. And then in 1963, Marley, along with uh, Bunny Whaler, Peter Tosh, and three others, formed a group called the Teenagers. And they are very much mimicking kind of those uh, American R&B like doo-wop groups, like uh, the Temptations and the Drifters and things like that. Um, then they changed. Uh, they had numerous name changes. They were then known as the Wailing Rude Boys, the Wailing Whalers, and finally just the Whalers. And uh, at this point, they were discovered by record producer Cox and Dodd, and the single um, that they released on this label, on his label, was titled Simmer Down and reached number one on Jamaican radio. In 1966, um, also of note, while in Trenchtown, uh, he worked as a um, welder and he was a co-worker of Desmond Decker so I thought that was a huh. that was funny he was 
kind of a famous ska musician and mm-hmm. um, one of the founding members of, and of that genre. A, and did have a song on the Harder They Come soundtrack, so we have covered him at least once. Yes. Of Desmond Decker and the Welders. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the Welding Welders. Um. <laughs> regular bands, the Aces, I believe. Desmond Decker and the Aces, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, in 1966, the others, um, uh, those other three members, uh, left the group, leaving it to the core three of Bob Marley and Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler. And then around this time, also his mom left for America, um, leaving him in Jamaica, and uh, went to uh, his mom went to Wilmington, Delaware, of all places, and um, I guess to make a better life. And and uh, later on, Marley joined her and uh worked at dupont there as a as a uh can't remember an assistant of some sort and also worked on the car factory i think and um it was also during this time period when uh he was separated from his mom that he became more interested in the rastafari religion and belief system and that obviously plays an essential role in kind of who he is as a person and um ties into you know his music very much so um and reggae as as a whole i think um also in 1966 he married uh rita anderson rita anderson who you know later joined the whalers and was part of the i3 the vocal backing singers um, of the group in um 1969 in jamaica is when kind of the reggae musical style came to prominence now we always talk about ska and uh, you know, reggae, but ska was very m- much around before reggae was. And uh, as somebody quoted in the Marley doc, ska is for uh, dancing and drinking beer versus uh, reggae, which is very much characterized by a slower beat. And the horns are gone, which are characteristic of ska, you know, especially trumpet and saxophone. And uh, in in reggae has more guitar in it. So... Uh, between 68 and 72, Marley, along with um, the other three, um, released music. The other three being Tosh, Bunny Wheeler, and his wife, Rita Anderson, worked to um, establish themselves as musicians. And in 72, Marley went to London, uh, which was seminal, and went on to tour with soul singer Johnny Nash. And this is when he met Chris Blackwell of Island Records. And we've referenced Island Records before, but many artists have uh, signed with them and they're considered one of the uh, prominent independent labels of of Britain. And um, uh, Jimmy Cliff, in fact, had recently left Island Records at that time, Jimmy Cliff of The Harder They Come. And they, um, so Blackwell saw an opportunity to sign Marley and the Whalers um, to Island Records and he believed that kind of the foothold that reggae could get or Marley brought to him was his image and kind of a rock sensibility in turn in terms of kind of that rebel and um, rebel sensibility. And he saw that in, in Marley and thought that's what he could use to kind of promote Marley and, and bring him more to prominence because at this point in time it is very much Marley was just kind of and the Whalers were very much just kind of a Jamaica band with some crossover in Britain so um, they returned to Jamaica at that time to record Catch a Fire which we talked about in a cold listen hot take and that was their fifth album in fact um, released in April of 73 Catch a Fire received positive critical attention and later that year their album Burnin was released which <laughs> had um, the song I Shot the Sheriff on it so uh, the Whalers disbanded in 74 to pursue solo careers, uh, but Marley continued on using the name of the group and reformed with new musicians and the I-3s, which were three women, including Rita, who provided backing vocals. Um, and you heard them on this album, obviously. In 75, their first international breakout hit was No Woman, No Cry, followed by the album that broke them in the U.S., Rastaman Vibration, in 76. Now, in 76, there was a lot of political tension going on in Jamaica. Um, there, there was two kind of political ideologies and, as a result, warring gangs on each side um, of, the, of the spectrum were fighting each other in the streets. And 
uh, you know, preventing kind of causing civil unrest and and uh, causing violence and all sorts of upheaval. Um, and as a way to ease tensions, Marley suggested a, a free t concert to kind of bring everyone together. And uh, it was called the Smile Jamaica concert. And uh, this ended up, uh, you know, the, the prime minister uh, agreed to do this, um, but then they kind of ended up twisting it for political reasons and using it to kind of promote an upcoming election, which Marley wasn't aware of. And um, so Marley wasn't happy about that, but it kind of was too late by then. And um, unfortunately, as a result of kind of being mixed up in the political side of things, you know, despite wanting to help Jamaica, it resulted in an assassination attempt on Marley um, two days before the concert. Um, him, uh, some armed gunmen were broke into the house and uh, shot at him and his wife and their manager. And he sustained minor injuries and went on to perform the concert as planned. But um, yeah, that's kind of a, an important event in his life. At the end of 76, he left Jamaica um, and briefly went to the Bahamas and then lived in England for two years in a self-imposed exile, um, to quote him. During this time, he recorded the album we're talking about today, Exodus, and the follow-up album, Kaya. And Exodus was the biggest, um, was kind of the big, like, seller breakout album not breakout album, but the biggest seller of their career. And uh, was released June 3rd, 1977, and was an international success. And this was their 10th album. So ACDC wow. did six albums, but this was <laughs> the Whalers' 10th album. Um, after Exodus, uh, I'm just going to go through the whole bio. There's not much more, because um, Marley, unfortunately, lived a short life. Um, after this, he released more albums and uh, was very much international kind of spokesperson and beloved figure and and performed in Zimbabwe in in July 1980 for the Zimbabwean independence um, you know they were known as Rhodesia and were a British colony and uh, they uh, became Zimbabwe um, in 1977 he was diagnosed with malignant melanoma underneath his toe and Marley went against doctor's advice to save his toe uh, to have his toe amputated and instead just had the nail and nail bed were removed. Um, now, in the documentary, they said, uh, you know, Marley was a big uh, football fan, soccer fan, and uh, this would have impacted that, but that's kind of, it also just to have impeded his his movement and music, musical performance because he's very much in a musician that moved around on stage and things like that so that's what they claim why he didn't want to be amputated um he also said that it kind of went against his beliefs his rastafarian beliefs um for treatment um now the documentary said is this was basically kind of forgotten about this incident and and as a result marley never received regular medical checkups um you know after this and um, that had a big impact on um, everything in uh, 1980, Mar Marley started a tour of the U.S. after touring Europe, and he performed two shows at Madison Square Garden, and while jogging in Central Park, he collapsed. And when taken to the doctor, it was found that the cancer had spread to his brain, lungs, and liver, um, basically his entire body by this point. Now, it's, you know, he, ha he probably had cancer, or he did have cancer when the toe uh, melanoma was discovered, mm -hmm. but um, because it was never really treated and, and never treated after the fact, it just continued to spread throughout his body. Um, two days later, he performed his last concert in Pittsburgh, and um, his health had now de deteriorated at this point, and the rest of the tour was canceled. He then went to Bavaria, Germany, where there was a holistic treatment center by this uh doctor named Joseph Issels who claimed to be able to, you know, cure cancer or, you know, treat cancer in some way that other places couldn't, I guess, and, um, and uh, you know, alternative cancer treatments. And then, uh, no surprise, after eight months of no success, he decided to return to Jamaica. And then after landing in Miami uh, en route to Jamaica, 
he was taken to the hospital where he died on May 11th, 1981 at the age of 36. Mm. He was given a state funeral in Jamaica on May 21st of 1981 and is buried with his guitar near his birthplace. And in 1994, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So that's kind of a, obviously just a snapshot of his life. Uh, You know, aside from being a, a huge figure musically for someone who lived such a short life. He really had a, a big impact on uh, music and, and, uh, and Jamaica, as John said, as a whole, bringing kind of Jamaica to prominence as well, I would say. So, you know, sorry for the down note ending as I'm known for in my bios, but what did you guys think of, of this 10th album by the Whalers Exodus? I guess, John, you start. Sure. I could definitely start. I, I love this album. Um, this was, this was, as the kids would say, this was a vibe, wasn't it? <laughs> it sure and I was. think sometimes, um, I think sometimes reggae gets unfairly lumped as sounding too similar, right? Cause there's elements of it that immediately identify something as reggae, but I, I love the lyrical content of this album. Um, the, the positivity always rings through the natural elements. Um, it, 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 the you really can't describe it any better than to say it takes you to a place, right? That feels like Jamaica, but it also feels like any place that is that vibe, that vibe of calm, that vibe of, um, uh, like a, almost like a spiritual feeling, if mm. that makes sense. Um, and you know, we've, we did catch a fire and this is to me a more refined album. Um, it catch a fire was just as good musically, I think, but this was sort of an an album where the sound synthesized across the whole album into a perfect blend. Um, and I think, I think for me, what really stands out is that you can, this is music you can either listen to and pay attention to with urgency and also can blend into the background if you need it to do that. It's very malleable music. Um, and there's not a lot of things you can say both of those things about, right? That it, it requires a, it can, it can require a, a strict listen and it can also require the loosest listen ever, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it can do both depending on what you're looking for out of it. Um, the, the steel drum and just the drums. I just love the sound of it. I love the, the rolling guitar and the rolling drums that, that, that identifiable reggae sound here that just permeates the album. Bob Marley's voice is always underappreciated for, because when you hear Bob Marley, right, you, you think of reggae, you think like all reggae sounds like Bob Marley, but Bob Marley is a gifted vocalist, Mm -hmm. like in, in, within the context that until you listen to other reggae or even things like, you know, first generation ska, you know, and different stuff like that, it isn't really till you, till you hear that, till you hear like what makes Bob Marley, Bob Marley. Um, and yeah, I just, there is like an etherealness to Bob Marley that when you listen to his music, there aren't a lot of people that, that have that presence. You know, I was trying to think like who, you know, who, and once again, like I was very big on like the journey this week. Right. And Mm -hmm. so I was trying to think of myself who has kind of the presence that, that Bob Marley does when you listen to it, that kind of gives you that vibe and you. You know who I came up with, guys? Jim Morrison. Hmm. He has a little bit of that, like when you listen to him, there's a there's an urgency that you have to pay attention to, but also it takes you, like the sound of his voice and the sonic palette and the charisma just takes you and, and makes you pay attention, right. I think. And that was really my takeaway from this one. Um, the, not to mention, you know, there are huge songs on this, right? Uh, uh, Jammin' is a, a massive song. Exodus is a massive song. Three Little Birds, One Love, People Get Ready. You know, these are all like, you know, first ballot reggae songs that we know of right now, right? But right. there are so many other great songs on this album. Songs like uh, So Much Things to Say is just an, a fantastic song. Turn Your Lights Down Low is another one I love. Um, there's 
there's deep cuts all across this album. So yeah, this is a high recommend for me. I really love this album. Yeah, another Jim Morrison's another artist that kind of died young and also has been mm-hmm. mythologized um, to some extent. Well, and you kind of get it, you know, because there's just you can't teach charisma, right? Yeah. And that's like what those just certain people have an innate charisma that just you can't fake it or learn it, right? It's just embedded. And I, yeah. I, I put Bob Marley in that category. He's just got a presence that that just others don't, mm. you know? Yep. Mm. Um, yeah, I knew this is kind of a similar listen to the cars in the sense that like I knew a good portion of the uh, probably actually this one a little bit less than the cars, but I knew half of the songs because, you know, because there's just, you know, this pr- pretty much the second half. Right. Because the first four songs, I think, were new. And then uh, turn your lights down low. That was a song I wasn't familiar with. Mm-hmm. And um, this is an interesting listen to uh, for me in February, where the it's twenty degrees out and there's <laughs> snow all over. Like this is not like usually I think of like Bob Marley and, and, and reggae. You're kind of on a on a Caribbean island or a beach somewhere or something like that, you know. Mm-hmm. So it it was kind of interesting for that. But um, I you know this is a fantastic record. With I'm with you, John. Um, I didn't. The only other Bob Marley album that I had, um, aside from the greatest hits, um, was the uh, I had Natty Dread. That was an album I think I got mm-hmm. from like BMG or something like that. For it was you know so I got that. And that that one had um had some songs that I knew, but there was I I remember not being that into it. Like it, I think there was part part of it was like the production wasn't nearly as crisp, and there was some. There's a little, a little bit more filler on that record, and this mm-hmm. one's just strikes top to bottom. It's just was one just one great song after the next there's there you're absolutely right john about the vibe um you know to me i i listen to this more uh I, i'm more in the latter camp of, of like having it in the background and just having the, the 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 sound of the music and the mood kind of like really that be the prominent thing that i'm listening to obviously although i do like the positive vibes towards the end particularly with three little birds and one love it's just like you know those are just anthemic songs in terms of just you know like it's a great song to put on when you just want to kind of like ground yourself and, you know, to put things in perspective and just go, you know what, I'm going to be all right. I'll figure out this problem, you know, like, and, and kind of move on from there. It's kind of, you know, somewhat motivating in that regard. So, um, but for the most part, this is mostly just about the music, the vibe that he's putting forth. I'm not, reggae's not, I'm not well versed in it at all. Um, but it's amazing how just, one person for me can just define a, an entire genre, right? And I'm sure that right. there's there's way the more people out people. there. Yeah, there's way more people out there doing reggae. You know, we've covered some things. Um, the you know the harder they harder they come mm-hmm. album, the, the 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 soundtrack. You know, and there's Toots and the Maytals. Well, Jimmy like Cliff's other... a big deal too. Like yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, but for me, and those are songs that like, I, I, for whatever reason, whether it's people that I've interacted with or just, um, you know, been exposed Peter to or really yeah. try to write, try, but try to delve into, but I never really, I don't know those artists like I know Bob Marley. And those are kind of very, 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 to me, ancillary artists compared to Bob Marley. Now I'm not trying to, nothing taking away from them. Yeah. It's just my experience with reggae. But this, when I think of reggae, I absolutely think of Bob Marley and um and this this is a great record there was no filler here this was just um you know th- th- that that kind of chill vibe I agree I like his voice a lot um it and the interesting thing is it's always kind of like with a lot of these songs like the rhythm the beat the groove it's it's very similar that's that doesn't deviate a whole lot from what he's doing but it's different than ACDC in the similarity because they're very like linear in their sound. But this is just to me, it's a much more enjoyable listen. It's much more consistent. It's much more I don't know interesting or just um, I, it's got ultimate ultimate re-listenability. This mm-hmm. this to me doesn't ever get old, and and it's and it's a fascinating thing for this uh, this type of genre which is it's pretty simplistic overall, especially when you go to compare it to like other artists that we've done that are really pushing, you know, pushing the boundaries and, you know, being virtuoso playing. I don't really get that here. It's just kind of one kind of thing that it's doing and it's just so well done. So good. So fun. Um, and just a really great listen. So I'm a big thumbs up on this. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm, I'm no different. This album is great. And for me, this was really a, an appreciation and, um, uh, realization that this is this album is such a repre- such a clear example of who Bob Marley was and what his 
his ideology was and kind of the synthesis of his ethos into the music and and for this is i don't know this is like the most an album that defines an artist could be in my opinion like you have the first the first half of the album is very much about religion and spirituality in the songs and then the second half is very much about that positive mindset and and about love and and uh and physical love too at in some point. So I feel like all of that adds up to what Marley was trying to accomplish. And that coupled, uh, you know, lyrically along with his great voice, like you guys mentioned, but also the whalers themselves really add a lot to, to the reggae sound and to this music. I think the backing singers add a lot here. Um, and then the effective use throughout of different instruments, um, the drums, you, there's keyboards in here, um, there's a, an exodus, there's horns are used effectively, and all of this kind of adds up to, you know, Matt saying that, you know, the music itself, song to song, doesn't really differentiate, but I think there is a depth there that when you listen to it, it separates each of the songs and kind of adds up to something um, as a whole. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, and um, but I think there is, that's why it's like an ultimate re-listenable album too compared to like ACDC is because there is like the things do kind of like separate and, and bring different things the more you listen to the album. Um, I think it's just kind of a summation of, of Marley and it's why everyone associates, uh, I think everyone thinks reggae is like what Bob Marley is in some way they're kind of like intertwined in that way even though reggae you know there's tons of artists that are reggae artists and they all probably different things but I think for for Marley reggae is that bringing religion and spirituality and this positive mindset to music and I think this captures that perfectly Um, also like John said it's such a maturation you know for this being a 10th album and you know, in mm. a 10, 10 year time span, you know, more or less is, uh, that is apparent too, because I agree. I think this sounds much different and much more mature than catch a fire did. And, uh, you can see it's just a, an example of what made him special and why it appealed to so many people worldwide and, um, and, uh, why he's so appreciated. So yeah, it's great. Um, nothing bad to say about this one. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't add too much more besides the fact that um, I, I don't want to like I like reggae. So I I always cringe a little bit at the idea that one person can define it. I, and I don't disagree with you guys. I think especially for folks that may know a little bit about reggae or like other versions of music as primary musics like he's Bob Marley's the ultimate gatekeeper of a type of music. Right. I, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of anybody in any genre of popular music that is associated like for some people singularly as the artist they go to. Yeah. Um, uh, there, there certainly is anybody for jazz or classical or rock or R and B hip hop. You know what I mean? I can't think of anybody who who is that. It's, Um, it's along with the country thing, right? He's got the country of Jamaica and he's got the genre of reggae, you know, just that's, it's him, you know, both things. Well, he's, he's a political figure too, which I think is there because I, I mean, who, who else is that, you know, like it has a, basically could determine elections in there. That's where we talk about, you said the Beatles, right? Like the Beatles weren't going to determine who the prime minister was, you know, in the way that like, you know, Marley was so feared, right. That they tried to assassinate him because he could swing an election, I mean that's that's heavy stuff that you yeah. you transcend music and and become a cultural figure and um, there aren't a lot of musicians that that become cultural figures and and maybe not even like I mean you can make an argument that it, it, that Marley in some ways was a like a top three cultural figure in Jamaica and and is there any other musician you can think of that ha- has ever hit that level no. uh, certainly not in the modern era maybe in like you know, the classical, maybe somebody like Mozart or somebody, you know, maybe, but even then I'm not sure, you know? Yeah. He's kind of on another level in some respects. He's kind of almost transcended music in in some ways. Um, Yeah. I mean, that's what it is. It's kind of that. Yeah. So 
it's it's pretty crazy to think about in context and mm -hmm. it's also crazy to think about how young 38 is um 36 yeah 36 or 36 yeah. i'm sorry 36 so even, <laughs> even worse jesus i mean yeah it's just, i didn't i didn't realize boy. that you really think about that it's interesting sometimes you're like oh i know bob barley's been dead you know for a while and stuff and i know he was it's not like i thought he was you know 60 or something but like there's just something very humbling about it, especially at the age that i am at you know just like <laughs> yeah. looking you're like holy shit 36 like he did yeah. like how much did he do in his life and this was their 10th album you know and he was still like five years away like he was what 31 32 when this came out so um yeah i mean he'd still yeah. be alive today potentially that's oh, like oh yeah you know so that's kind of crazy um yeah well, he'd be in his 80s right right yeah so wow yeah uh yeah strong thumbs up for me yeah mm -hmm. for sure same